I'm Greg Hex um, of Hex Financial Group and the CEO. We're very, very delighted that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we're so excited to see people coming out, listening to the topic. The Aspire series was started because we had people that aspired to hear about things that were things that were not typical financial topics. And we've had people here with uh, discussion about the bullet journey, with things about where's Dallas growing and what's it doing. Some of the things that we as business people need to know, need to understand. So, um, you know, and as a firm, just want to remind you that we rebranded for 32 years. We were Chapman Hexton Company. Uh, we also had White Rock and Hex Financial Group was formed and created with Hex Capital Partners to put our three different pillars underneath one group to where the Hex Financial Group consists of investment banking, corporate finance, the CPA firm and our wealth management, as well as our own family office. And but it gives us a comprehensive solution for business owners. So if we can ever help, uh, whatever it is, whether it's cash, capital, corporate finance, audit, tax, financial reporting, you know, modeling, all those kinds of different things, as well as wealth management, helping people work through those liquidity events. That's the world we operate in every day. Um, our clients are usually 500 million, maybe up into a billion, and down to maybe 20 million in revenue. So we're true what I call middle market. And we deal with people all across different industries. We're pretty agnostic when it comes to that. We touch a little bit of everything. Uh, we've got about 30 to 40 people here in Dallas. Uh, we also got an affiliate office in Mexico City. And we do a lot of international work with the 25 people down there, as well as all across the European continent and, and into Asia. Um, they, we find that there's a lot of movement with capital coming into the country, as you can imagine, with people fearful that you know somebody will take things away from them. And so we do a lot of that working with our international clients on cross-border type of things. So please, let us know if we can help. We're here as a resource. We're delighted to have you, as I mentioned today. Um, and we want to call to your attention to that we have a CP evaluation form. For those of you who want CP credit, you know, please fill it out or turn it into, or turn it into a front desk. We also have a speaker evaluation form. We're looking for topics like this, of things, if you know of people who are speakers that have written a book or they come out or they have a topic you think would be of interest, please let us know. One of the things that we started doing a year or so ago prior to the pandemic was highlighting a nonprofit that we also thought for just a few minutes that we wanted you to hear about. And today, before I introduce our speaker, I want to introduce you to Christine Volkmer. She is with eQuest here in Dallas. For those of you who don't know, eQuest is an amazing organization that we want to make you aware of. Uh, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that today. But I want to give her a few minutes to talk about some of the wonderful things they're doing in the community, and then we'll introduce our speaker and kick off this morning. Hey, thank you, Greg, very, very much. I want to thank Greg. Greg was a board member of eQuest um, a few years back and uh, knows us well. So good morning, and thank you for having me. I want you to know that often, often I hear, I have no idea this place was here. I had no idea what EQuest was or that we had this treasure in our city. It's one of the, the it was the first equine therapeutic center in Texas. We train a lot of other centers around the country to do what we do. So we are a charitable 501c3 organization. We are located down at the Texas Horse Park. How many of you know where the horse park is? One, two, three, four. You know where the Byron Nelson was a few years ago down at the Texas Horse Park, golf, or the, or the <coughs> Forest Golf Course? So they're basically our backdoor neighbor. We're snuggled right into the, the Horse Park um, Forest, and uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's one of the best kept secrets, and I hope you'll come down. Our mission is to enhance the quality of life for children and adults that include veterans in our sphere um, who have diverse needs. And we have 30 therapy horses that we um, partner with to help them achieve a better quality of life. Lots of diagnoses walk through our door, from itty bitty two-year-olds to <coughs> elders. They come in with physical, um, intellectual, emotional disabilities, um, hearing and vision impaired. And what we know is that the partnership with the horse actually helps them achieve a better quality of life. Our particular therapies that we provide are PTOT. 
So if you take a child who has cerebral palsy and they're going to clinics and they're going into hospital settings and it, it's pretty sterile environment and it's great and it does a lot of good, but if I take that same child and bring them down to the horse park where there's little ponies and there's big horses and they get that same treatment with a licensed PTOT and get to have that experience, it's mind-blowing changing for that child, for the families um, that we serve. We also take people into therapeutic horsemanship where the goal is that they're actually achieving equestrian skill sets, which is very, very helpful. We have equine assisted learning. We launched a literacy program in South Dallas as an incentivizer to get the kids to read. We also do mental health counseling and we have a veterans program. So I'm here because I know you're here and you all have some capacities to help. So one of the things I'd love for you to do is you or your assistant, follow us on LinkedIn, right? We're the um, Equest Therapeutic Horsemanship. We also have volunteer opportunities, and I bet some of you have employees that really like to get out there and give back. This is one of the coolest places to come. I have a group coming in today from Salesforce, a group later this week from Ernst & Young, Goldman Sachs. They're coming in because their younger employees really love to roll up their sleeves and come out and help. Great way to have that sticky employee engagement going on. Um, they also sometimes love to do that lower level, join our Pegasus Club, do $20 a month on their credit card. They forget about it, but then we bring them in a couple times a year to engage and have some fun down at the horse park. We also have a really cool thing going on two things. Our gala is June 4th, um, which is, as Greg knows, was a, one of the best parties in Dallas. You do not have to wear a tux. You can wear whatever you want, cowboy boots, and, and your, um, your plus one can wear squishy skirts and cute things. Um, it's a lot of fun. And then in September, we also have, Dustin knows this, our finance forum um, golf tournament that benefits eQuest, which is a lot of fun. It's at Cowboys. Um, so here's, here's what this translates to. We have a $2.5 million budget that I have to hit. And here's some ways that that translates. A $5,000 donation provides five veterans with six weeks of mental health counseling. You can see the bond that happens with a counselor, of course, and someone who's um, really challenged with re-entering into civilian life. 2,500 would provide two clients with um, six PTOT sessions. So you can see how that little guy has cerebral palsy and we use the horse as a dynamic moving force in lots of positions to help them. Um, a thousand would provide two clients with therapeutic riding. 500 provides two PTOT sessions for a client and 200 would cover the entry fees for clients to enter our spring horse show. Competition is a fabulous thing for children with disabilities <coughs> to learn to be part of the team. We can provide scholarships for as little as 25 a month. And that is it. So I hope you'll come down and visit anytime. I'm going to leave some materials about the gala and the golf tournament out on the desk and be around to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We actually uh, sponsored the Finance Forum tournament last year with Dustin and that group, and Equest was there. I think we sold it out, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so I would encourage you to participate in some of that stuff and get involved. Uh, it's great to be able to do some of those fundraisers. Tim and I have a real bent in, in Dallas. We're trying to give back to philanthropy as much as we possibly can and make as many different impacts in different places, and Equest is one of those. So we appreciate Christine coming this morning. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker, Carol Montgomery. Harold I've known for a number of years. He has an impeccable record of building and growing companies across the U.S. and in India, um, achieving rapid growth and profitability of what he's done. He's also very experienced in cryptocurrency, uh, blockchain applications, NFT, raising funds in the U.K., Europe, India. <clears throat> in fostering banking relationships and managing international entities. So you can see why we have a lot of stuff in common with what Harold is doing. He also has a broad-based knowledge of domestic international US payments and money transfer laws and regulations. A month or two ago, we were having lunch and he mentioned 
this presentation to me, and I jumped on it and said, we absolutely want you to come speak to Aspire. It's a topic that I think people would really find an interest in. I know you're going to be entertained. We're already talking to him about a Crypto 201, so you can get a college you know, class and get some hours you know, in crypto here in the next few months or this year. But we were discussing other things that are things that I don't even know what they all mean. And he's going to introduce <laughs> you to some of that stuff this morning. I think you're going to learn some new acronyms. Okay? You'll sound very wise when you're out talking to your 21 year old who knows he's probably already got a crypto you know account somewhere and you don't know about it okay and um, but welcome Harold. hey great thank you Yeah, horses are a tough act to follow, especially when your slides don't work. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's see if we can make this happen here. A little hard to talk about technology when you can't operate the technology. Um, okay, anyway, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate you getting up early to come out and see me. Um, it's not too late to leave if, you, uh, uh, if you're disappointed. Uh, but uh, cryptocurrency is an area I've been uh, working in directly for two years and writing about for about 10 years. Uh, my background is in the payment space. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. But uh, this technology is really exciting. Uh, it's got profound implications for the way money and value generally move uh, for intellectual property. Uh, on the web, digital intellectual property, uh, and a lot of other implications that uh, will unfold over time that we can't even imagine today. So without uh, any further uh, uh, delay, let's talk about cryptocurrency. First of all, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what is cryptocurrency, how does it work at a pretty high level, um, why is it important? Why is, why is everybody talking about cryptocurrency all of a sudden seemingly out of nowhere? I mean, 2021 was the year of crypto when it became a topic. And, uh, and so the reason you're here today is you want to know, why does this matter? Why should I care? Where are we now in terms of the development of the technology and the adoption uh, of the technology, both in business and in the consumer world? And then lastly, the important part, how do I make money on it? And if you want to tune out the first four and just wait for this one, you, you certainly can. Uh, but uh, that's what everybody wants to know is, uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot of people are making money on crypto, so how do I get in on the act? Um, well, why am I here? More than just uh, Greg buying me lunch, um, I've been uh, a long time, 30 years, in the payment space. That means credit, debit card, checks, international money transfer, person to person, money transfer, all kinds of things like that. I am, uh, I've been CEO of seven different payment companies. Uh, my uh, superpower is identifying opportunity, scaling it up, and then uh, usually selling it. I've been, as I said, working in crypto for the last two years, although I've been studying it for a long time before that. I'm now currently managing director of WireX USA. WireX is a London-based company that has a crypto management app, which you should all sign up for and use a lot. Um, and uh, uh, my job is to get them in the U.S. market, which we did uh, as of February 7th. We are live in the U.S. with our crypto management app. And we combine that with a prepaid Visa spending card. So you can actually spend your crypto in a real world environment with our app and card combined. So it's very cool, it's neat, it's merging the crypto digital world and the real world of retail and buying bread and eggs and milk together so that they become a practical alternative for people um, and they can actually use their crypto. Um, and. Um, Last, and, and so let's talk about now, what is cryptocurrency? What, what is it? How does it work? Let's start at the beginning. Cryptocurrency, very simply stated, is digitized value, right? So you can take anything of value and you can digitize it. And a slightly more complex and sophisticated definition would be that a cryptocurrency is an encrypted data string that denotes a unit of value. A unit of value could be a dollar. A unit of value could be anything, but it's a unit of value, right? So it is monitored and organized by a peer-to-peer -peer network, person-to-person -person or entity-to-entity, -entity, no intermediary in the network. And it is tracked by something called the blockchain, and the blockchain serves as the secure ledger of the transactions the record of all the transactions, any transfer of the asset back and forth is logged on the blockchain. And that could be a sale, it could be a gift, it could be any transfer, it doesn't matter. 
Okay, so the key concepts, let me pull out the key concepts for you because we're gonna come back to these over and over and over. These are the foundational concepts. It's encrypted, it's secure. The encryption protocols are basically not breakable. I mean, in, anything's breakable. It's just a matter of making it more difficult to break it. These are extremely difficult to break and, and to the point that they're impossible, right? It's like, think about how you secure your home. You could break, anybody can break into your home. You're just trying to make it a lot more difficult to do than the neighbor, so they'll go rob the neighbor, not you. And this is sort of the same logic. There's nothing perfect here. So when you hear the word encrypted, I just want you to hear that it's 99.99999% protected, right? Uh, it, it can't be perfect, but it can be functionally impossible. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. It is decentralized. That is a word you are gonna hear over and over uh, forever for the rest of your life, as long as we're talking about this, because it's decentralized. I can send anyone in this room crypto and there's no intermediary. There's no Federal Reserve Bank. There's no bank. There's no nobody. It's you to me and me to you and back and forth and that's it. It is secure, the, the, the ledger of transactions is secure. It's automatic, it's run by computers, it's instantaneous. It is immutable, and another word you're gonna hear over and over, it can't be changed. Once the, it's logged in the blockchain, the record of the transaction cannot be changed. And I'll talk to you about how that happens in a minute. And uh, it is transparent and visible to all parties at all times. So anybody can go to what's called Etherscan and look at all Ether transactions, or ETH, that's a coin, transactions live in real time and see them forever, right? All the way, the history, all the way back to the very first Ethereum transfer, you can see it on the blockchain. You know who sent it, you know who received it, you know how much it was, you know the date, the time, you know a lot about that transaction and it's visible to everybody. So that's all great, but it's pretty abstract. So let's talk about a real world analogy that we can build on to get to really where we are with the technology in a practical sense. And the best analogy I have for you is poker chips. Poker chips are a great analogy for cryptocurrency. So let's walk through how poker chips work at a transactional level. So we have our typical Aspire attendee here. Uh, who goes to Las Vegas to the casino and he puts cash into the casino and he gets back poker chips in his hot little hand and he goes out to the casino floor and he's going to roll the dice and he's a great guy so he's going to buy us all a lot of drinks and that cycle is going to repeat itself a number of times and here these transactions that are occurring now live at the casino table and I'm sure you've all had this experience I personally have, have read a lot about it um, and are, are actually great analogous cryptocurrency transactions. At the end of this process, this guy is gonna total up his, uh, his winnings, he's gonna deposit that cash back into the, or the chips rather, back into the casino, and he's gonna get back cash, and then if it were me, it'd be a lot less than he started with, but nevertheless, that's how that whole thing works. So he came into the system with cash, he transacted a lot, and he left the system and got cash back. Okay, that's analogous to what's happening in crypto today. Now the one, th crypto makes all this a lot better and easier, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. The one thing crypto can't do for you is explain to your wife why this was a good idea, that you gambled away your next house payment. But let's notice a couple of things about the character of these transactions. How do they work at a mechanical level? Well, first of all, there's a lot of positives here. Number one, they're very fast, right? right? Poker chips, instantaneous. You, you trade them, that's it. Tight, right and title to that asset has moved when you give it away. It's cost free, it doesn't cost you anything to give somebody a poker chip or to receive a poker chip. It's anonymous. I don't know you, you don't know me, but I know that poker chip and I'll take it. It's what we call frictionless in the business, right? There's no forms to fill out, there's no intermediary to go to, there's no, I don't have to explain this to anybody, I don't have to justify it to anybody, I just give it to you and it's decentralized. This is really key. It's a direct party to party transaction. If I gave you a poker chip, that's it, right? You give it back, whatever. We can do this all day long. That's all great. I love all that stuff. Fast, easy, frictionless. I don't have to talk about it, I don't have to explain, whatever. 
But there's some things that I don't like about this. There's some things missing here. What could, how could this be better? Well, first of all, it's anonymous. And anonymity cuts both ways, right? In some circumstances, I like anonymity. This is why cash will never really go away in our economy, because people really do value anonymity. And they value the ease and frictionless nature of a cash transaction. So cash is, when, when people talk to you about a cashless economy, they really mean a cash-less economy or a less cash economy. They don't mean a no cash economy. Cash is never going away. Just forget about that. But so anonymity cuts both ways. There are times, however, when I want to know the counterparty. I want to know what this is about. I want to know the date and time. I want to know a lot of other stuff. There's no metadata around a poker chip transaction. I didn't get the date, I didn't get the time, I didn't get the purpose, I didn't get the terms of trade, I didn't get any of that, I just got a poker chip. Um, there, it's not visible, right? We could do this in the dark of night. Nobody else saw the transaction. That is part of anonymity, but it's also an issue for business transactions. I don't necessarily want an anonymous transaction that is not visible to other parties that I might want to see that transaction. It's, um, it's not divisible. I can't break a poker chip in half and give it to somebody. A, a $10 poker chip's a $10 poker chip. Um, it's not transportable. I can't take it outside the casino that issued it and use it someplace else. It's only good in that closed environment. And so it's not ubiquitously accepted. Right? Other people, you go, you go into Caesars, you buy a poker chip, you go to Bally's, and that poker chip is, is worthless and people won't take it. Right? And it's only physical in nature. I can't digitize that, so I can't use it on the web. And as we all know, commerce is migrating to the web very rapidly, and, and I can't do any of that. So these are, these are limitations of the physical means of transfer that poker chips give us. But let's build on that. So what if we could keep all the good stuff? You know, let's keep all that good things, those good attributes that we had. It's, it's frictionless, cash-free, et cetera. But let's add these other things. Let's make it digital so we can put it on the web. Let's make it ubiquitous. Let's make it global. Anybody in the world can use it as long as they can log in and authenticate themselves. Let's make it automatic. Let's make the computer do all the work. Right? Why, why should I carry around a ton of poker chips and count them out and all that other stuff? <clears throat> make all the computer do all that. Make it tradable, make it exchangeable easily and, and again frictionlessly, make it divisible. I, want, I might want to do really, really tiny little transactions. I'll talk to you about why that is a thing in a minute, but I might want to do a transaction with a valuation below one cent, a thousandth of a cent, even a millionth of a penny. That's a viable transaction that's not able to occur today. I'll talk to you more about it in a second. I want it identifiable. I want all that metadata that we talked about, time, date, place, counterparty. And I want it visible to everybody around the world at all times, anywhere and everywhere. If I could do all that, I'd have a cryptocurrency. So that's, that's building on that a real world example and transferring it to the web. That's what a cryptocurrency is, and that's what a cryptocurrency does. right? So let's talk about how does this work? How, how, do, I, how do I know that what I bought is real, and how do I know it has value, and how do I know I can actually uh, liquidate it and transfer it to another party in a reliable way? Okay, so let's talk about the blockchain. This is where blockchain technology and the concept of blockchain comes in. So again, I'm gonna stick at the, at the uh, conceptual level here. If you wanna break and, and dig in a little deeper, we can do that. But at the conceptual level, what happens is you have, let, let's say you have some crypto now and you've got it in your, in your digital wallet on your computer or your phone and you've got a transaction and somebody else comes in with a transaction and somebody else and somebody else. So we've got a stack of transactions now that need to be logged into the blockchain. And we're gonna take all those transactions and we're gonna put them in a metaphorical software box. We're gonna group them together, we're gonna put them in the box, we're gonna close the box and we're gonna uh, group them like this and we're gonna call that a block. A block is a group of transactions. And the number of transactions and the scale of them and the terms and all the metadata and all that, that's all previously agreed to in the computer. You as an operator don't actually have to do anything. All you have to do is hit the buy or sell button and all this is cataloged for you and then sent to the blockchain. That's all the protocol of how the blockchain operates. And then we're going to get another block. Because right behind you is somebody else who wants all these transactions logged. And then we're going to get another block after that, and so on and so on and so on. And so we get all these new blocks. But you're quickly going to ask, well, that's all great. A block is great. I get it. 
but how do they relate to each other? Well, what we're going to do then is add, in, insert on top of that block, when we close the block, we're going to impose on it a computer algorithm, 256K, 256 bit algorithm, meaning it generates a, a giant matrix of numbers, of 256 different numbers, zeros and ones. And uh, we're going to add all that together and we're going to come down to an answer, a number that is the identifier of that block. And in this example, I used the number seven. So for, for conceptual purposes, you can think of this as adding the digits of your phone number together so they reduce down to a single digit. And if you change anything in your phone number, it'll change the answer, right? So if you change the, the 214 to 314, it won't add up to the same number anymore. And that's what's going on here. You're adding it all up, and you're coming up with an answer. And in this case, I use the number seven. It's actually a much bigger and more complicated number, but conceptually, that's what's going on. And then, and here's the key part, we're going to call that a hash. So you hear a lot about hash rate. That's the rate at which you can calculate this answer to the block identifier number. That's the hash rate. So I'm going to create a hash, and I'm going to add all this stuff together. I'm going to get a hash number. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to take that hash, and I'm going to put it at the top of the next block. Now that hash is unique. It can't be changed. It's, this is where my seven example falls apart. But the hash is unique, can't be changed. I'm going to put it at the top of the next block. I'm going to include it in the hash algorithm of that block, and I'm going to come up with another answer. In this case, I show you nine. It's a giant hash, but it includes the hash at the end of the first block. And then I'm going to do the same thing, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I'm going to add all these together, and that is what is going to make a blockchain. A blockchain is a chain of blocks linked together by the unique hash at the beginning and the end of each block, and each one relates to the other and cannot be changed without messing up all the subsequent blocks. So if I change anything in any one of these transactions, I'll get a different answer for the hash at that block, which won't match the hash at the top of this block, which will mess up that one, and that one, and that one. So you can't change it without fouling up the whole thing. So that's what makes a blockchain. That's what makes it immutable, can't be changed once it's logged. And it's all instantaneous. It's reliable. It's authentic. It's real. That's what gives it value. OK? So let's notice a couple of things about the character of those transactions again. All the positives are there. Fast, automatic, cost-free. Computers are doing all the work. Frictionless, decentralized. Anybody can interact with the blockchain. Uh, you, you've got to go to an exchange to do it, but anybody can interact directly with the blockchain. It is party to party, peer to peer transactions. Now, we've got a whole bucket of more positives that we didn't have before. It's physical, uh, excuse me, it's digital, it's automated. We got all the metadata. You can have all the metadata you want in that. I, I talk about date, time, counterparty identity. You can go even further and talk about terms of trade. You can have what is called a smart contract, meaning a previously agreed to terms of trade that people are going to interact under those rules. It's all done. It's yes or no. You say yes or no, and that's it, right? Uh, it is not anonymous anymore. Your identity, the, the, the person who uh, enacted that transaction and the recipient of that transaction, their identities are well known, well understood, and visible to everyone at all times. It's divisible into tiny little units as far as you want to go. It is transportable. It is instantaneously global. Uh, and it is ubiquitously accepted by all the parties in the system by definition. Right? Everybody who comes into this system and buys a Bitcoin is implicitly or explicitly agreeing to be a party to the system. And it is immutable and can't be challenged or changed later, as I said. And that all amounts to it being trustless. You do not need to trust anybody. We've all grown up in a world where the identity and the character of the counterparty mattered, and it's a matter of judgment. There's a lot of gray area. People don't always do what they say they're going to do. Yeah, OK, we got a contract here, but we're going to have to take to court and all that stuff. OK, forget about it. The terms of trade are understood. 
you don't care who the counterparty is, you don't care where they are, you don't care what legal regime they're operating under, they can be in the mountains in Pakistan and you're sending them Bitcoin and they're sending you back Bitcoin or whatever, you will never, you can know if you want to, but you won't care where they're located or who they are or what they're up to. You don't care about any of that because you got your value back. And the trustless part of it is what makes this important. Right? That's, all these characteristics are why this technology is important, because they solve a lot of profound problems that are inherent in the financial and the payment system today. So let's talk about how to put that to work. Okay? My job as a businessman is to understand the technology, but I've got to figure out how to make money on it. Yes, sir, you had a question? Harold, uh, you listed a whole lot of positives. Yeah. I'm wondering, are users of cryptocurrency looking for anything above and beyond that? They start, is there more? positive stuff that can be added to make a cryptocurrency different? Okay, I did not pay him to ask that question, <laughs> but I probably should have because your timing is, is brilliant. And the answer is yes. <laughs> the, the answer is yes. And uh, I'm going to talk about it in just a second. So hold, hold the phone. Is there, is there more? Like the, the salesman on late night TV? But wait, there's more. Yes, there's absolutely more. So let's talk about use cases. Let's talk about Bitcoin. The Bitcoin sort of version one of this technology, it has become a store of value. Bitcoin was originally created as a payment mechanism. If you go back and read the original, what's called white paper, the for foundational conceptual document of Bitcoin, they talk about it as a payment mechanism. I wrote an article in 2012 saying Bitcoin is, is not workable as a payment mechanism, right? It clears very slowly in payment terms and it, is, uh, it fluctuates in value wildly. Sure enough, I was just at Bitcoin 2022 last week. People are saying Bitcoin doesn't work as a payment mechanism. It fluctuates in value and it's slow to clear. Now, they're adding technology on top of Bitcoin called the Lightning Network that is fast and does not fluctuate in value and will be a thing in the payment space. I'm not gonna get too far down that rabbit hole, only to partly answer your question about does this get better from here? And the answer is yes, it does. Lightning is a great example. There are others. So Bitcoin, and here's the instrumental point about Bitcoin and why it's become a thing, bypasses fiat currencies and government controls. Remember we talked about the trustless nature of it. Okay, inherent in using a national currency, the dollar, the Argentine peso, the Indian rupee, the Russian ruble, is a level of trust in the people who manage the currency, in our case, the Federal Reserve. We all buy into the fact that the Fed knows what they're doing. My guess is the reason those meetings are closed is because they sit around and go, what the hell are we doing now? You know, but they don't want you to hear that, but you are a, an implicitly willing co-conspirator in the management of the dollar by definition. You don't really have a choice, right? They do what they do, you live with the consequences. Okay, let's talk about why that matters. If you live in India, the Indian rupee has lost 50% of its value over 10 years in terms of international buying power relative to the dollar, right? That is a steady erosion of your wealth, labor, and work over time that you can't do anything about. You just live with it. The Argentine peso is down 85% in five years. You wanna talk about a catastrophic financial event. We don't really get this in the United States because we don't have this problem, but they've got it in Argentina in spades. Here is a graph of Argentine Bitcoin conversations over a 10 year period of time, and you can just see what's happened in the last three to five years. It's exploded, and we're not done, by the way. The last bar on that chart goes up, way up, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, Russian ruble because of what happened in Russia, down 25% in one month, right? You couldn't do anything about that if you wanted to. Look at all the sanctions. I mean, I actually have friends in Russia and they're just howling in pain because they're just watching their life, their livelihood, their value, their everything just evaporate over t overnight, right? Because of what happened in Russia and the circumstances that are out of your control. Okay, Bitcoin transcends all of that. You are no longer living, economically at least, at the whim of a central government who might invade another country. 
and close off your economy and destroy the ruble. Uh, the ruble's actually come back up for a lot of different reasons. We can talk about it if you want to. But, um, but you're no longer living at the whims of the central government who have a different political agenda than you have, and they're manipulating the economy to suit their purposes and damaging your uh, situation uh, as a consequence. So the top countries that own Bitcoin by percentage of the population are the Ukraine and Russia, not really very surprising under the current circumstances, but that precedes the war. Venezuela, again, not a huge surprise. What surprises me about Venezuela is it's only 10%. I would have thought it'd be much higher. Singapore is an exception to the rule I'm about to apply to this chart because they're much more technologically forward here. They've been very aggressive about crypto. It's really a crypto hotspot, so they're an exception. Uh, but you get into Kenya, USA, notice USA, I'll come back to them in a minute, India, South Africa, Nigeria, Colombia, Vietnam, Thailand, all of these countries with the exception of Singapore have what are perceived to be unstable currency situations or political situations that affect the currency and the value of the currency. And I'm including the United States in that. Who doesn't think that the spending the federal government did around COVID is not causing today's inflation? Right? I said that in an awkward way. Uh, everybody thinks, true or not, you don't have to be an economist to, to have an opinion about this. Everybody thinks last year's spending is fueling this year's inflation. Period, paragraph, right? So we have an unstable currency. There are people out there who will tell you, and they know more than I do, that the dollar is a bubble and will collapse at some point. And there's a pretty good argument around that. We can give it to you if you like. Um, it's, a, it's an argument you can't dismiss out of hand. Uh, and, and so this is an issue, and you will see this argument about Bitcoin as a store of value uh, become a much more prevalent uh, uh, topic in coming years. Did, did you want to ask a question, sir? Yeah. Why is the India quantity of owners so much significantly than the rest of the majority? Uh, well, of course, India's got a population of 1.3 billion people now, so, so only 7% is 100 million people. But, by, but in terms of, I, I did this by percentage per uh, uh, ownership, uh, penetration of the population, not absolute number. If you go absolute number, India is off the chart uh, in terms of the number of people involved in crypto. And the India, for a very long time, I, I spent eight years building a business in India, has been uh, looking at gold as an alternative to the currency. I mean, just seriously, I'm, I'm not out on a limb when I say nobody likes the rupee. Yeah, right? They're all onto it. They've been living with this problem for decades. And they've been buying gold as a store of value. Now you give them Bitcoin as a store of value, and they're all over it. Right? Yes, sir? Ah, interesting question. Uh, China got really big into crypto and then banned it. So crypto, crypto mining, anything to do with crypto is banned in China. And it, uh, 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 since, sorry? When did they ban it? Ah, great question. Uh, because it is exactly what I'm telling you it is, which is a way to circumvent the central government. So what China did do that's very interesting, and I, I can't resist going down this detour off my presentation because it's too fascinating. I'm a political science major. So what the Chinese did do is create a digital renminbi. And a digital currency, I'm about to introduce you to a debate we have not had in the United States but will, uh, is the most invasive political uh, tool for social control ever invented. Ever. By far. It's nothing compared. I mean, you know, police informing circles and so on they used to have in China and self-criticism circles and all that stuff, nothing compared to what you can do with a digital cryptocurrency managed by a totalitarian regime, which is, in my opinion, exactly what China is. So let me give you some examples. Because of all the things I told you, right, it's transmittable, it's transferable, it's immutable, it's visible, etc. That means whoever issues the currency, in this case the central government of China, can control it. They can control where it goes, who gets it, how much, and how long it's good for, right? The Chinese issued a currency to, to support a, an area that was involved in a natural disaster that had a viability of two weeks. It expired in two weeks. You either spend it or it evaporates. In China, they have a regime of social control, social points. 
you may have read about, right? If you jaywalk, it's a point off. If you do this, it's a point off. If you do something for the party, it's a plus point. So your social score, so what you're going to see is a marriage of your compensation and your money and your social score. And they can do that. They can control your cryptocurrency. Imagine a situation where the government can evaporate your money at the push of a button for whatever reason they want to and they don't have to explain that to you. So this is a tool for invasive social intrusion and control, the like of which the world has literally never seen. Now, we haven't had this debate in the US when it comes to what is known as a central bank digital currency. Notice it's issued by the central bank. And Bitcoin is completely decentralized and you can't do that with Bitcoin, right? So all those countries I just talked about, you. People are flocking to Bitcoin because it's exactly not controlled by a central state. Yes, sir. What's going to stop Bitcoin as an example from doing the same thing China can do with its currency? You can't. It's totally decentralized. Nobody controls Bitcoin. It's completely peer to peer, so right? Whereas the difference. There won't be a Facebook issue where I don't like Anthony's political stance globally. You can't. No you can't take away my Bitcoin. Right? To do that, you'd have to go back in the earlier blockchain and invalidate a transaction, and you can't do that. Right? So it, again, that's why people in these other countries, and increasingly in the United States, are flocking to Bitcoin as a refuge to get away from centralized governments. Because in the Chinese example I gave you, the central government is issuing and manipulating the management of that currency. And that's not what <coughs> true decentralized uh, cryptocurrency is about. Okay, so let's talk about use cases. Uh, we talked about a store of value. Very important, very profound use case. You're gonna see that grow over time. Um, so we don't need to talk about that again. So let's talk about how this technology, not Bitcoin per se, but how the technology can do a couple of different things. First of all, it can improve existing transaction types. It makes them frictionless, instantaneous. Uh, you can forget about credit cards. You can forget about debit cards, wire transfers, ACH, all that stuff. You guys are, are business people by and large. How many of you have signed off on a big business deal and then you're sitting there waiting for Fedwire to clear and it's just nerve wracking. ACH, you, you file an ACH request on Friday and it's a federal holiday that doesn't clear on tu till Tuesday. Ah! You know, we've all been through that. You can miss payroll that way, for God's sake. Okay, that isn't gonna happen anymore. These transactions are instantaneous. They are immediate. You hit the button, it's done, okay? Yeah, they make new transaction types possible. This is really key and a profound uh, observation is, uh, here's, here's the rule of thumb in payments. As you lower the cost of payment processing itself, you unlock the possibility of new transactions occurring that could not occur because they were cost prohibitive. How many people have seen small merchants say no, no credit card under $10, right? You can't buy a stick of gum with a credit card. Why? Because the profit margin on that stick of gum is less than the cost of processing the transaction. So they won't do it. Now, you go to crypto, you can process a micro or a nano transaction efficiently, cost effectively, and so you will be able to buy a stick of gum mm -hmm. with crypto, right? Because it's cheaper, faster, and easier it unlocks the possibility of what are known as NFTs. This is a whole separate presentation. NFTs are non-fungible tokens. You can think of them as digital intellectual property, an artwork on the web, a picture, a photograph, a chapter of a book, a poem, a word, anything can be made into an NFT, locked and, and made unique, and then traded with crypto. Um, it unlocks micro transactions in the business. That's a transaction, anything under a dollar is a microtransaction, and it unlocks nano transactions less than a penny. Right? These are two separate categories, two different use cases. But you might say, well, who the, who's interested in a transaction less than a penny, right? The retail example I gave you, a stick of gum, a penny, probably fine. But how do we get less than a penny? OK, you've undoubtedly heard about the Internet of Things, right? We now have 200 plus billion devices transacting with one another automatically and trading information via the web. You have nothing to do with it. It's happening live in real time. We crossed a key barrier in 2015 when we had more devices than we had people on the web. So the web is about things talking to each other now. It's not about people talking to each other. People are a diminishing share of the activity on the web over time. Um, that means that all these, oh, sorry, let me go back to that slide and just finish the thought. That means that all these machines are gonna transact with each other. 
And how's that going to happen? Well, it's going to happen according to previously determined terms of trade. And you're going to, the machine's going to produce some level of information that has monetary value. And it's going to be automatically priced and automatically traded. And the value will transmit automatically in the background. You'll never know what's happening. Let me give you an example. Your car is spewing out giant amounts of information that are not captured today. And any one of them has very low individual value. Collectively with, yeah, I don't know what we have, 200 million cars in the whole country, there's a, there's a real value there. Let me give you one example that is real. Your odometer reading. When your odometer hits 65,000 miles, there's a lot of people that want to know that. Uh, one of them would be tire makers and tire sellers, because your tires are rated probably for 70,000 miles. And at 65, you're going to buy new tires. And they're going to want to know that. And they'll pay to know when your odometer hits 65,000 miles. They're going to pay somebody. In my language, they should pay you. But they probably aren't. They're going to pay somebody for that information. And then you're going to get coupons and offers and whatever by local tire dealers to come and buy the tires if it's 10% off if you come by Friday. And you might think that's a great idea. right? It's only junk mail if you don't want it. If you want it, it's a valuable coupon. Right? So you're going to start to see stuff like that happening. Your refrigerator is generating giant amounts of information that is not monetized. It, none of it has a great deal of value. It's a nano transaction. But collectively, it matters a lot. I mean, how great would it be? My refrigerator just broke about a month ago. How great would it be if the manufacturer had called me and said, hey, look, your compressor just turned on for the 11,000th time. And we know that the failure rate on refrigerators after 11,000 on-offs it goes up a lot. So your refrigerator is going to fail. How about we just bring you a new one? And better yet, how about we put it on a subscription plan? How about you just pay us a little bit every month? Don't buy a $1,000 refrigerator. Just pay us 5 bucks a month for the life of that refrigerator, and we'll guarantee you always have a working refrigerator in your house. How's that transaction going to happen? It's going to happen by cryptocurrency, because 5 bucks a month is, is not worth writing a check. And, and putting a stamp on it, right? But if you had a crypto account, they could just hit your account every month for five bucks, and you're going to see subscription models proliferate in the economy. And already, Volvo, as an example, has a program. I bought a Volvo in September of 2021, and immediately thereafter, they came out with a subscription program for exactly the same amount of money that I pay on my car payment. I could have subscribed to Volvo and traded in my car every year for a new one. And they pay for insurance. They pay for the car. They pay for everything. All I have to do is put gas in it. And, tire, and they pay for tires, too. And they pay for everything. And all I got to do is go back in a year and say, I want the new one. And I get that. And that's $700 a month. So the world is about to change, and this technology is part of what's driving that. So where are we now? Well, we've got generation one already, Bitcoin. It's just a coin. It's the vanilla product. It's uh, uh, not more than that, although, again, layers like Lightning I talked about in a minute are coming on to the technology to broaden the use case and the applicability of Bitcoin. The principal use case, though, is a store of value and basically speculation. The market cap of Bitcoin right now is about $728 billion. If you'd asked me this question last June, it would have been $2 trillion of Bitcoin is out there. You calculate that the same way you calculate a, a stock market cap, the current price times the number of Bitcoins. Um, the t volume of Bitcoin traded last year was $15.8 trillion. $15.8 trillion. This is a real number. Right? Transactions were 300,000 per day of Bitcoin going back and forth, average last year. But the problem is, there's a couple of problems here in terms of expanding the applicability of Bitcoin. Number one, it fluctuates wildly in price. I mean, last January 21, it was 20,000. Then it went to 60,000. Now it's about 40,000. That's not really good for any kind of retail or commercial transaction. You can't. Uh, accept Bitcoin at 40 and then wake up the next day and find out it's at 20. Plus, your employees don't get paid in Bitcoin and all kind of other problems. It's also very slow. In transaction terms, Bitcoin can take minutes or even sometimes hours to clear. That doesn't work, right? The, the volatility kills you. Now, there are remedial technologies coming out. I don't want to get lost in those. Let's go to generation two. So people look at Bitcoin. They go, this is all very interesting. You know, I like, I like the good stuff here, but it's lacking. So let's keep going. Let's invent what we call Ethereum. A guy named Vitalik uh, Buterin 
uh, stays up late and uh, codes something called Ethereum. So what's the big deal with Ethereum? Well, Ethereum allows for something you were asking me about over here, which is smart contracts. Does it get better? Yes, it gets a lot better. Smart contracts are previously agreed upon terms of trade under which people can transact. And if you walk into 7-Eleven and you buy some juicy fruit, you're actually executing on what is a, amounts to a real world analog of a smart contract. You know the product, you know the price, you know what you're gonna get, you know what to do, you just go do it. There's not a lot of discussion, you don't bargain, you just throw your money on the counter and walk out the door, right? That's a smart contract. So we're gonna take all that, we're gonna code it in computer language, and we're gonna execute it automatically between machines. Principal use case, digital commerce. That's a pretty big label, but that's what's going on. Market cap, currently 325 billion. Again, if you'd asked me last year, it'd be about double that. Um, 2021 volume, $11.6 trillion of Ethereum traded hands last year. And here's the key characteristic I look at as a payments guy, 1.1 million transactions a day. Now to give you a comparison, a standard, this is still small potatoes because Visa and MasterCard combined do a billion transactions a day. But keep in mind, there were invented in the late 50s, we're now in the 20s, you're talking about a technology and a system that's 70 years old and well penetrated into the economy and growing all the time, not done, if you're looking for a stock to buy by MasterCard or Visa, but, um, but 1.1 million uh, transactions a day is a real number and 11.6 trillion is a real number. Um, Visa and MasterCard, as I said, they're at a billion transactions a day. So we got a long way to go, they're roughly a thousand times bigger. But give it time to bake. Now, that's all great. We still have some problems. It turns out Ethereum is very expensive to operate, so let's go to generation three. What, where are we in terms of what's coming next? Is yes, sir. Bitcoin convertible to Ethereum? Yes. Well, you've got to sell it and, and buy something else, but yes, you, you can't convert directly. Um, so it's all based on the timing, though. If you sell it when the value is down low, and it's almost like still trading on the market, you're still trying to guess low. Correct. Guess low. Analogous to a stock. I mean, we've got a guy in the audience, Corey, where are you, who does day trading on cryptos. And, you know, I should just hand the microphone to him. The market is tanked, by the way. Yeah. Okay. So I'm costing you thousands of dollars sitting here listening to a presentation. You already know how it goes. Okay. Let's talk about the next gen. Okay. If, if Bitcoin's good. Ethereum's better. We're going to now make it great. Does it get better? Yes, it does. It gets a lot better, actually. Let's talk about Polkadot. It's a better, faster version of Ethereum. I'm not going to get lost in a lot of these because I think we're probably running out of time. But um, Polkadot is a better, faster Ethereum. Solana supports smart contracts and NFTs and is exploding. Uh, Chainlink is a universally connected smart contract platform. So smart contracts can now talk to each other, right? Terra is a stable coin platform. You can put in your Bitcoin, you can get back what's called a stable coin. A stable coin is a fixed unit of value, tied typically to the dollar, for example. Um, uh, Algorand it, it is scalable smart contracts. So smart contracts need a variety of sizes and scales. Avalanche is faster and cheaper than all of those. Cardano is decentralized finance. This is a whole huge area we can talk about, but that's peer-to-peer -peer lending and borrowing. IOTA is one of my favorites, super fast, free, and powers the internet of things. Okay, where are we in internet adoption? I see Greg's getting impatient on me here. No, no, no. Excuse me, just a few more minutes. Yeah. Uh, where are we in, inter in uh, internet uh, versus Bitcoin adoption? Okay, in the internet, I'm sorry the star is probably hard to read, is in, is in uh, blue here. It took seven and a half years for the internet to go from 130 million users to one billion users, right? That took seven, eight years actually. Uh, Bitcoin and crypto are on a trajectory to add that much in four years. So the adoption curve is virtually vertical here. We're going to add 850 million users by 2025, or 400% increase in the population of people involved in crypto. Why is that happening? OK, in, this is a sort of a classic marketing breakdown, right? You have the early adopters, you have the early majority, late majority, and the laggards. Where are we? Well, you're about done, or you are done, with the early adopter population. The guys with the nose rings and the earrings and the long ponytails and all that, they're down here somewhere, right? These are the guys who don't deal very well with other people but are really great with computers, okay? They're hanging out down here. And uh, <clears throat> the early majority are the people who are very curious about this technology. Corey 
Corey's an early uh, early majority uh, player demographically. Uh, you know, in his uh, above 30 years old, certainly 35, 40 in that range. Got a deeper pocketbook, willing to play. Um, that is a giant population of people that are going to come into crypto. It's four times the size of everybody who's involved in crypto today. And key observation, there's another 4x beyond that waiting to come in who won't get here for another four or five years. Um, if you feel a little disoriented about all this, don't feel alone because in a chart of human progress through time, it's been really amazing, but you ain't seen nothing. right? Get ready for a tsunami of technological change and development that is happening uh, live in real time uh, all over the place, it's, this stuff is proliferating like you can't believe. The learning curve is totally vertical for guys like me. I learn something new every day and I've been in the space for 30 years. Um, so let's get down to the key part. This is where you can wake up again. How do I make money on it? Well, there's basically two categories here. Passive strategy, you can buy and hold. For most people, this is what I recommend. Go in and buy some Bitcoin, some Ethereum, maybe some of the others I mentioned, and just hold them. This technology is young. It's got a long way to go. There are going to be bumps in the road. Just hang in there. Uh, it's going to be uh, several years. You can buy crypto funds. There are funds, private and public, that buy crypto. You can buy stocks like Coinbase, actors in the ecosystem. Coinbase is sort of the analogous uh, maybe to Amazon.com would be the closest thing I can come up with. Um, you can buy public ETFs, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust as an example. These act and behave like a stock and move pretty much along with Bitcoin. Um, you can invest in mining pools. There are people who are mining. One guy's in commercial insurance here. His client's building a giant mining facility. People are gonna mine Bitcoin and create it and there's a reward for that and it's pretty profitable. If you wanna talk to some of those folks, I can connect you. Uh, you can be more active. You can do what Corey does in day trade. You can do mining yourself. You can set up a computer and mine Bitcoin or Ethereum and create it. It's not really that hard. Uh, you can do a coin launch of your own. You can come out here with the hexed coin or the whoever coin and you can launch it. If, if you have a use case in a marketing program, you can do that. Uh, you can think of that analogous to basically an IPO or uh, it's called an ICO, an initial coin offering. Um, there's some issues with the SEC with that, by the way. Don't just run off and do that. Uh, let, let's talk about it before you pull that trigger. But anyway, that, that's it on what I have for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Thanks a lot, or Bitcoin and blockchain. Thank you. So in all fairness, um, for those of you whose head is spinning, okay, or you can't sleep over the next two or three days, we can arrange counseling, okay? Um, we'll arrange you to talk to her on a private basis, okay, so you can never feel comfortable. But we wanted to expose you to this. We wanted you to see it's one of those cutting edge things that's going on. Um, a couple of questions. We're only just a few minutes after nine. We'll take two questions, and then he's going to be around for a while. Yes, sir. Well, the question I've had all along is for the hundreds of billions or whatever went into the initial issuance of the of Bitcoin, where'd that money go? Great question. And who's let's, got it today? Let's take Ethereum. Oh, or do you want to focus on Bitcoin? Either one. Okay. Uh, well, let's take, let's take Bitcoin because there's, there's more than one answer to the question. So in the case of Bitcoin, uh, the answer is there wasn't an ICO. There wasn't a big drop like you'd have in an IPO where a ton of money comes in and a ton of tokens go out. Bitcoin is mined one at a time by actors in the system. So when the price of Bitcoin was quite small, below a dollar, you were mining Bitcoin and you're getting back a Bitcoin worth 50 cents or a dollar, and it's just incremental. So it went out to all, the, in that case, it went out to all the participants in the system. Now, in a case of XRP, maybe you've heard of Ripple, their co token is XRP. They issued it, so the founders got together, created a company called Ripple, that's supposed to facilitate bank transactions with a cryptocurrency. They issued XRP, a lot of people bought it, the founders sold some and got the money, and the company got the money, and that became their venture capital fund. Right? They didn't go to traditional venture capital, they bypassed it, and so when I talk about how disruptive this is, I'm talking about a great use case is disrupting venture capital. You're seeing classical venture capital on the sidelines in this space because people have issued coins and funded their company that way. They don't need to deal with the venture capitalists. The venture capitalists are buying the coins because it's the only way in to get in on the deal. So in that case, the SEC comes along and says, okay, look, we've got this thing called the Howey test, uh, which you may have heard of. There's sort of four bullets around whether something is or isn't a security. 
And one of the characteristics in the Howey test is, did anybody benefit from the transaction directly or did a company get the money? The answer is, yeah, they did. I think the, the SEC then files a lawsuit against uh, Ripple and XRP uh, and saying that's a security that was issued illegally. And I think they're probably right. Now, that's going on in New York, and we'll see how it resolves. But that's the answer to your question is, who got the initial drop? Well, it was Brad Garlinghouse and his buddy, can't think of his name, who sold you know a billion dollars worth of this stuff and pocketed it and the company got a couple hundred million and that's how ripple's funded but that's a security in my judgment bitcoin and ethereum have been deemed by the sec to be not securities because they are decentralized sorry wasn't there a big uh, loss or somebody got in there in north korea or somebody got in yeah yeah so the technology itself is immutable and not hackable. What you're hearing about in North Korea, the Lazarus group, and there's a great podcast called The Lazarus Heist, by the way, and another one called The Death in Crypto Land. But these are not hacks of the fundamental technology. They're hacks of the privacy protocols that surround the ownership of Bitcoin and other cryptos, right? So I just want to be clear, the technology itself is bulletproof, but the, the where you store your crypto or how you store it or the security protocols around that are not bulletproof, right? So it, it, think of uh, buying a diamond. It's always going to be a diamond, but if you put it in a safe deposit box and the bank gets robbed, that's not the diamond's fault. That's the bank's fault, and it's a similar analogy. So when North Korea is hacking these things like they did last week, they got $621 million of uh, Bitcoin out of a, a game in the Philippines has been wildly successful called Axe Infinity. They hacked into Axe Infinity and stole their Bitcoin, right? So that's not Bitcoin's fault. Mm. Yeah. So we talked about adapters um, towards the end there, maybe on a consumer level, but what do you think on a commercial level for businesses to start replacing the wires and these? Yeah. That, that's going to take a while because you have a high need for certainty in those uh, circumstances, but it's going to happen because of all the positive characteristics I mentioned. Uh, you're going to have, though, um, to get legal uh, framework around that to justify the validity of a billion dollar transfer or something like that, but it's going to happen. So let me give you an example. Uh, you all probably know Mary Kay, one of our very uh, successful homegrown companies that sell cosmetics on the party plan. Well, they operate in South America, all over South America. It's one of their key markets. Uh, you're talking about 10 or 12 different countries. You're talking about 10 or 12 different currencies. You're talking about price fluctuations all over the place. Uh, life would be much simpler for Mary Kay if they had a Mary Kay coin that people could buy into, transact, and then they could take it out in dollars or whatever later. That would be much simpler for them much cleaner, better accounting, all that other stuff. That's sort of a category of internal corporate use case that doesn't really uh, tie into the external financial markets, but gives you a, 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 an idea of how this can make uh, transactions a lot better, right? And the same will be true for corporate treasury. Uh, you're going to see direct transfers, uh, uh, paying of AP by stablecoin. It'll be much quicker, faster, auditable, et cetera. It's going to happen. It's just not quite there. It's, that one's got to bake a little longer. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much.